my slides, I realize I have about 40 minutes of content. So I'm going to try to fly through this as quickly as I can, uh, glossing over some of the less relevant stuff for this audience. But that's me, and I like to splash this slide up because I don't have any cards, and so if after the talks people come up to me and give me cards, uh, feel free to take a picture of this. I'm going to flash this up at the end of the talk as well because otherwise we do this awkward thing where it's like, oh, I'll take your card, I don't have one, and I'm just having that discussion with you all now. Okay. All right. So, now for something completely different. Um, we're going to talk about augmented reality beyond sight. And the way that I think you can kind of contextualize this talk in the context of the conference is um, these are maybe the early building blocks for potentially thinking about how technologies such as these might be incorporated into the city of the future. There you go. That said, I'm not going to touch on data too much today, which is something I don't get to say very often. So um, this is my bona fides, so you know why I'm standing up here talking to you. I have some experience uh, working for different companies in immersive media. Um, now I work at Bose, and it might seem a little odd to be an augmented reality evangelist at Bose, but I'm going to talk about that in the middle of the talk, and I do a shameless plug. But let's start, if we could. Oh, I pressed the wrong button. I hope that didn't screw it up. Okay, great. Uh, with story time. Here we go. Look at these great slides. I put these together myself, so feel free to have a good laugh. Uh, hopefully they can tell the story. It's just a clip art I found on the internet and my own uh, slide you know, PowerPoint skills. So, Good Samaritan, 2052. Just imagine it's 2052. And let's say we're in San Antonio. Anybody familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan? Not familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan? Okay, I don't normally get like hearty nose. That's good. Um, that's good. Uh, so what's the, what's the story of the Good Samaritan? Just briefly. Help the strange person on the road. It's like a New Testament story in the Bible. Basically, there are rival tribes. This guy gets beat up by a rival tribe, gets left on the side of the road, he's dying, and all these other people from different tribes, not his, are passing him by and looking at him and saying, oh, that's not one of ours, so I'm not going to help him. And then a random person from another tribe comes and helps uh, and, and saves him, essentially, gets into, I guess, the equivalent of a hospital, a hospice of some sort, or an inn. Uh, where he can lick his wounds, and um, it's kind of a harsh parable if you think about it, but it, like the bar is really low, right? Like, it, it, if you have to struggle to find somebody who will help somebody dying on the side of the street, but the point is, um, you should do kind things to strangers when you can because it benefits everybody. All right, so, much less extreme version of that, uh, let's call this person Sarah. So Sarah's walking down the street in San Antonio, she just got done hanging out with her friends, they had a few drinks, they were relaxing, and she's just glowing inside. So she's thinking about that. Uh, and suddenly, she's walking down the street and she realizes she doesn't know uh, where her home is. She's a little lost. She's unfamiliar with the area. She's not sure where she is on the street she's on. So she focuses inward on her sixth sense. And this little device that she's wearing in the middle of her chest that buzzes uh, when she's uh, close to magnetic north, she starts to listen to that device, mentally listen. And when it becomes a, a constant thrum, she knows in what direction she needs to go. Okay, so she needs to go left uh, at this next street, and she's on her way home. So, she turns left, she goes down the street, and she sees a sign for a hotel. This is literally like the only half-lit up hotel sign I could find on the internet. Um, and part of the words are not lighting up, so the T-E-L, let's say, are not lighting up. So she says, you know what, I'm in a good mood, she's still in a good mood from hanging out with her friends. I'm gonna do a good deed, and it's the Good Samaritan, for the night, and I'm gonna help this person out. So she calls up, Look at this. You ready for this? Ooh. She calls up a holographic uh, image of the architecture of the code that's running that sign because it's on the city's grid and it's publicly available. And she notices that there is a particular, maybe, cylinder that has a, a data leak in it. So she goes and she grabs a, a, a shape out of the toolbox that means something contextual to her, fits it in there, and the leak stops. She twists it, press start, closes it, and the sign lights up completely. I don't have that one because there's not a version of this uh, clip art with the sign fully lit up. <laughs> so she goes back home. Look at this. This is my crown jewel right here. Wait for it. Wait for it. She goes back home and she thinks, okay, it was a good night. I hung out with friends. I did a good deed. And uh, now I'd like to turn the light on uh, and do some reading before I go to bed. So she lifts her hand like this and the light turns on. Look at that. That was awesome, right? Uh, and then she sort of adjusts it down with a, a slight gesture. Um, no words necessary. And then opens her e-reader, whatever it is. We probably assume it's still a Kindle in 2052. And, uh, and she reads. And that's the end of that story. So what if I told you that all of that technology I just described is available in some rudimentary form today? 
far be it from us having to wait until 2052. So it's true, back in 2015, there was a researcher from a university in France, uh, Frank Sherman, I want to make sure, Schumann, Schumann, <coughs> Schumann had an arm there. Um, and he created a magnetic belt that people could wear that buzzed uh, in the direction of magnetic north. Now, magnetic north, I've learned so much about this since working at Bose, story for another time, is not the same as true north, and there's such a thing as magnetic declination. So you have to account for a person's <coughs> location in the world, but nonetheless, it's an interesting uh, and useful marker that can root you in an absolute position depending on where you are, right? And so he put these as an experiment on people, three different groups of people, people who were sighted, meaning can see, uh, people who were born blind, and then people who went blind later in life. And of the three populations, the people who were sighted and went blind later in life were able to use this in combination with an internal map, which they used to navigate uh, and wayfind in the world, which the non-sighted people didn't. They were using landmarks, so like, you know, uh, turn left at the big tree, turn right two streets after that, that sort of thing, instead of like, uh, you know, turn left to go north, and then in three miles, turn right, right? So, the people who thought, especially in terms of uh, having a mental map, were able to use this to develop almost a sixth sense of what direction they were in, so they could tell you, oh, I'm facing east right now, which I have no idea if I am. I have more of these. Um, and so even after they took it off, they kind of had this tingling sixth sense. So the image I showed you was actually this thing. In 2016, someone tried to productize such a device, and it's Try to make it look cool with a guy flexing, right? I don't think this product's available anymore. I, I looked it up, but nonetheless, this was done in 2016, and you just put it on your chest and buzz in the direction of, of magnetic north. That's it. Um, so that exists. The piece where I told you about calling up the holographic interface. This is a funny guy from Epic Games who helped Microsoft announce Hololens 2 a couple of days ago at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. Hololens is Microsoft's. They call it mixed reality. It is augmented reality uh, headsets. Um, and it is actually pretty amazing, I'm pretty high on HoloLens. HoloLens 2, uh, HoloLens 1, has anybody here heard of HoloLens? Or who has tried a HoloLens? So you remember where you have to use this sort of like gesture with your finger, right? So you have to turn your finger into a mouse pointer in HoloLens 1. Well in HoloLens 2, you can literally just physically move around. It has a bunch of um, hand gesture recognition built in so you can manipulate objects like if you were watching Minority Report, the movie that kind of pioneered that. Um, so that's already available, and there are already very serious applications. They're, they're targeting mostly at, at uh, businesses, at hospitals, um, people doing in serious industry, remote work, etc. Um, that piece exists, and then this guy, Jordan Schutz from PubNub, I happened to see a talk with him at a conference in San Francisco last week, and I thought it was a relevant example. So he gave an example of wearing a Magic Leap, which is another augmented reality headset that has a lot of buzz in the industry today because the company has just been raising you know, billions of dollars for years and they finally announced their device um, and there's a lot of interest from developers in it. So in concert with a service from his company, PubNub, he put together a demo with a video which I couldn't find unfortunately for this, where he literally is wearing a headset, he does a gesture like I just imagined in 2052, Sarah did, uh, and he was able to turn on and off the light by some sort of flick of the wrist, and then also adjust the brightness just with the gesture. So all the building blocks are there in some sort of rudimentary form. And all of these also represent, well, most of them, I guess the Hollow Ones uh, too is, is in combination with visual. Augmented reality that isn't necessarily based on your visual cortex and serving your information. So let's back up. What is AR? I went and I did some research on the internet, as, as we are wont to do, and I looked up the Google definition. Google says augmented reality is a technology that superimposes a computer-generated image on a user's view of the world. Hmm. Okay, that's pretty specific. Now that's fair because Google has a vested interest in visual-based augmented reality. They've spent billions of dollars in research and productizing things like AR4, which lets your smartphone have, a, what is it, Childish Gambino on it, dancing around, if you've ever seen that commercial. Um, and a whole host of other projects that involve computer vision and augmented reality based on sites, so that's fine. Let's check Merriam-Webster. Uh, an enhanced version of reality created by the use of technology to overlay digital information on an image. A little closer, but still not quite there. I'm an impatient person, so we're just going to cross these out. We're going to use the Blooded Dictionary, uh, which I think has a broader definition that I would love to see this adopted more widely, or some version of this. An enhanced version of reality created by the use of technology to augment human capabilities in the real world. Is that fair? Yeah. 
It's kind of fair, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be based on images. At least that's my thesis for this talk. So, if we use this definition, hopefully, uh, you know, this, this sort of percolates, or maybe uh, as people start to discover other forms of augmented reality are actually useful for real people, this will naturally happen. But it is true that today, augmented reality is mostly visual. And we're talking, when we're talking about visual augmented reality, because I want to give you something of benefit, uh, we're talking about computer vision. So computer vision is, mm, some people consider it, and I'm one of these people, a form of artificial intelligence because it shares a lot of traits with the main form of artificial intelligence that is actually used today called machine learning. Anybody heard of machine learning? Yeah. So computer vision shares a lot of traits with machine learning. Um, and you can read the definition yourself in the interest of time. I'm going to fast forward. So magically, which I mentioned earlier, this is what it looks like. Kind of interesting. Uh, if you notice, it has a bunch of cameras all around, right? And those cameras are using computer vision algorithms to sense the real world and build a digital mesh. So if I were wearing a magically right now, it would be scanning this room and trying to recreate these tables and these chairs so that when I wanted to place that very important Pokemon, it looked like the Pokemon was on the table or behind it instead of just sort of on a flat surface, right? So that's a lot of what computer vision is used for with augmented reality. Um, HoloLens 2 also uses this. Um, so do your mobile phones, by the way. If you're using an augmented reality app uh, on an iPhone, you're using AR Kit. If you're using one on Android, you're using AR Core. So computer vision is hugely important in visual-based augmented reality. Snapchat, here's an example of them using computer vision in their app uh, so that you can take a look at those sweet sneakers uh, and then go buy it with their Amazon referral link. Very commercializable technology. Um, and you can actually make something similar yourself. It's very easy to get started. If you're a hacker, a creator, a technology enthusiast, check out Euphoria, Open Computer Vision, Open CV, uh, Wiki2. These are great services that let you do augmented reality demos and apps yourself. I've done a few. Uh, we'll go into details here, but they're kind of fun. Uh, and there's also a lot of tutorials online. That, that guy, Siraj, is a really great resource. Um, that's just a video showing how easy it is to get up and running with something that does object detection. So, now we get back to augmented reality beyond sites and my shameless plug time. You may be interested to know uh, that Bose is doing something in augmented reality, specifically non-visual augmented reality. So the tagline that we're throwing out there a lot is heads up and hands free, which I am honestly, it's one of the reasons I joined the company. I'm, I'm all aboard this train. I'll tell you why in a second. So, I personally believe that even though we are primarily visual creatures, um, and a lot of our brain power is, is uh, devoted to that, um, we've begun to reach around the maximum of what our visual cortex you know, can take in terms of input, and just overlaying more information, having to stare at more screens. I wake up every morning and look at my phone, and then I pull out my tablet, and then I have my PC, and then in the evening I'm looking at my TV. And I just really am on board the mission to expand the definition of how we can augment the human experience beyond our visual cortex. And Bose, fortunately, was right there for me, um, introducing this product last year at South by Southwest. Um, I joined the company a few months ago. Bose AR is essentially audio first. So there's no, uh, this is the first device that they ship in. They're called Bose Frames. They don't actually have anything that you see. They're just sunglasses, confusingly enough. Uh, well, they're sunglasses that are Bluetooth speakers, right? So you can take calls, make calls, you can uh, listen to music, and it's directional sound, it's open ear, so you can actually hear the world, um, and it's not blocking you off, but there's not that much sound. They're pretty cool devices, they're experimental, and they have this little bundle of sensors in the top right, which is what Bose AR basically is at a hardware level. Those sensors are similar to what you have in your phone. There is a magnetometer, an accelerometer, and a gyroscope, and it can do things like recognize gestures, like if I double tap the side, if I nod yes or no. We've seen some developers create custom gestures where they're detecting people ducking, if they're doing jumping jack reps, if they're doing push-ups, if they're running. Uh, the, the building blocks of something interesting. They have to run via a mobile app because at the end of the day they're basically a peripheral, a wearable, like a, like a smartwatch, um, but on your face. Um, and so right now we have an iOS SDK. Uh, in a few weeks at South by Southwest, since we're close to Austin, I should plug this, Bose is going to be doing a ton there. So I recommend coming by. We're going to have a bar called Half Step. We're going to be at it for three days. If you want more information on this stuff, I'm going to try to move on quickly because I'm already over time. Uh, but basically, this is just the first of many form factors that Bose AR is going to come in. Uh, we've already started shipping products to consumers that have Bose AR in it. We haven't flipped it on. We haven't announced anything. We haven't done any uh, major uh, telling of people. What we have said is in 2019, we're going to have this uh, a target platform of more than a million devices in the hands of consumers. 
that they're actually already using because they love Bose. We can flip it on and you can actually build apps that take advantage of Bose uh, AI. So there's a developer platform. Right now we support Android, iOS, and Unity. Moving on quickly from that. Bottom line, at the moment time, augmented reality should be in the service uh, of the growth of human potential. And we limit that potential with really people like yourselves playing the future of smart cities. Um, you know, only limit it to the visual. I think we have so much more that we can begin to think about. I hope the story at the beginning helped ground that a tiny bit and what a good version of that, not dystopian, might look like. Um, but it's been a pleasure. Oh, final prediction. I love this part. Um, who's familiar with Winnie the Pooh? Okay, so imagine you're at some charter school, or your, your child is going to a charter school, and that school has decided to adopt the, uh, is it Disney? Disney, right? Disney owns Winnie the Pooh? I just assume they own it, maybe. Okay, uh, they, they decide to adopt the Disney educational package, and that comes with a virtual buddy that the students can interact with at home who helps them complete their homework in the form of one of their favorite characters. In this case, maybe Winnie the Pooh. Little Johnny there, little Billy, just whatever, just assume those are their names, uh, take this, this guy home. They wear their glasses, or maybe it's beamed up in their eyes, and the, it helps them do their homework, but they also form a bond with it. And this uh, little avatar can share memories between kids. So when the kids get together, sometimes they like to have the avatar there. They start to get really attached. So mom and dad are getting a little worried. They're saying, oh my gosh, our kids have imaginary friends. Like, what are we doing? We need to be you know, friends with real people, et cetera, right? And so the kids are gonna grow up, um, this is basically my thesis, with a much bigger digital divide uh, between uh, the previous generation, maybe it's uh, millennials or Gen X, than we have with our parents, which is saying a lot considering all the changes that have come down the pipe the last 50 years. So I think it's gonna be really interesting as the next generation comes up with a different definition of what's real and we start to become the crotchety old people that are like, if you can touch it, it's real. If you can't, it's ethereal, right? So that's my prediction. Thank you guys for having me. I don't think I have time for Q&A, but thanks.